I want to welcome all of you uh, to the second day of our conference here at Citizen University's uh, annual national gathering. And, you know, it is a remarkable thing to look out at this room and to have spent time with so many of you over the last uh, two days and to recognize that uh, literally, uh, I mean, just last night I was in conversation with people in this room from Detroit, from Austin, from Oakland, from Philadelphia, from points all between, from every corner of this country. And people who are doing the work of unpacking and deciphering and making visible power. And that really is uh, the thing that I would like to speak about this morning. This moment, this moment that we're in right now. You know, last night, uh, Paul Rucker gave us a little uh, trivia question asking us when the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation had been issued, asking us when women earned the right to vote, asking us when Plessy versus Ferguson had been decided. And we talked a bit last night about the ways in which history rewinds and reverberates and circles back and is always with us. And as we sit here in this moment, 150 years past the end of the Civil War, 70 years past the end of the Second World War, 50 years and a week past Bloody Sunday in Selma. We think about where we are situated in history, about what this moment is. And you recognize a couple of things. Number one, we are but links in a long chain of causality and consequence and responsibility. But number two, that there is something remarkable and unique about this moment, that we are not only 150 years plus, 70 years plus, 50 years plus, but that right now, and you can feel it, you could feel it last night listening to our panelists and our speakers, we are at the beginning of a new era. We are marking a new phase that 50 and 70 and 150 years hence, people will be thinking something turned in the United States then. Something shifted. More people became more aware of the disjunction between our stated ideals and our actual institutions. More people became more aware that they could do something about closing that gap between our institutions and our ideals. More people became more aware of the actual meaning and the content of our citizenship. Citizenship is not about documentation status. It is not about legal status primarily. It is about personhood. It is about membership in a community. It is about ownership of responsibility. And it is about recognizing that freedom, that liberty, is not merely the removal of encumbrance. It is not merely the throwing off of tyranny. It is the acceptance of responsibility. As we gather here this morning, I'm very conscious as the son of immigrants from China that in China today, people who, heck, if there was an organization called Citizen University in China, a non-governmental organization, it would be shut down right now. That if people came together in the four or five, six hundreds as they are doing, as we are doing here today, to learn about power, to learn about citizen voice, to excavate history and think about how we deploy what we find in history to make change in the present, we would be rounded up. We would be on lists. We would be, without warning, detained, our offices disrupted. You think about what's going on in the wake of the Arab Spring and the way in which that moment created such a sense of possibility. And yet, people have come to learn in painful, painful ways that freedom is not only the removal of tyranny. Freedom is a set of habits of mutuality and responsibility. On this day, we're going to spend a great deal of time with one another thinking and talking and practicing about two simple ideas, power and character. Indeed, I would posit a simple equation. Power plus character equals citizenship. And I want to say a word about each of the pieces of this equation. Power, the theme of our gathering is citizen power. We heard last night so much about power in the economic context, facing and reckoning with inequality and the ways in which inequality erodes the content of our democracy. 
power in the context of race and racism and racialization of our public policy. But let's take a moment and actually think about what we mean when we say power. I define power very simply. Power is simply the capacity to have others do as you would have them do. That's it. And that may sound a little bit menacing or stark or Machiavellian in some evil way, but it is not. It is simply a statement of capacity and a statement of the human desire to have others do as we would like them to do. Power takes many forms in civic life, and I think it's worth our thinking about this morning, but also as we go through the arc of this day and learn not only from some of the folks who will be joining us on stage here, but from each other, from the people you are seated with at your tables and the people you will encounter in the hallway and in breakout sessions to become literate in these various forms of power. There is, of course, people power. And your presence here, your decision to show up this morning is testament to the power of people power. That particularly in a democracy, in a place where, again, the stated ideal is that the people shall rule, that there are times when, in spite of everything, the people can rule, where the people can actually make their will heard and followed in the practice of self-government. But that depends in part on another form of power, which is ideas power, the power of an idea. We're going to be hearing today about various ideas about the true meaning of liberty, about the true meaning of community and equality. Last night, we heard Ai-jen Poo speak about dignity and care, words that are very easy to just wash past because they are, well, they're cliche or they're just sentimental, but they're not. They're ideas, and embedded in those ideas is a great deal of power. We're, of course, going to reckon today with money power because the power of money is dominant not only in our politics and our campaigns, but just in the way that this society, this Society which is not only a democracy, but a capitalist democracy is one in which market imperialism and the language of markets has crept into every other aspect of life. The power of money to buy and the power of the idea of money to frame our sense of what things are worth in life is remarkable. The power of the state and that's the power to imprison, that's the power to compel, that's the power to decide that marijuana shall or shall not be legal, that is the power to decide that some shall or some shall not be able to marry who they love. The power of the state is a form of power that we also have to reckon with. And for all of the idealism and energy that we heard last night from our activists from St. Louis and Ferguson, one of the most striking things about their comments yesterday was this recognition that in a couple of weeks there will be an election in Ferguson. There will be, perhaps, a new city council in Ferguson, Missouri. And that new city council is going to change some things, perhaps not enough things, but more than a few things. And they will be exercising state power. There's the power of social norms. Social norms about, forget about what the law says is okay or not. What do we all say is okay? Again, on marriage equality, for instance, on marijuana, the norms of the people have gotten a bit ahead of where our putative elected leaders are. That norms about what we will consider to be acceptable, tolerable, indeed honorable, shift, and that each one of us has an incredible capacity to set in motion a cascade of changing norms. And then, of course, there is the power of force, simple physical force. We've been speaking a lot about that in the context of policing in the United States, but force is not only violence and the capacity for the state to monopolize violence, it's just simply the ability to compel others. And if our system is working well, that is the form of power that is a form of last resort. That people and ideas 
and norms should prevail in a healthy, functioning, inclusive democracy. And our goal today is to really unpack these different forms of power and to increase our literacy in power, to feel more comfortable speaking the language of power, to not feel like that's a dirty word, to not feel like talking about it is somehow the province of only a few who have the titles and the station and the authority to exercise power, that every one of us owns power and every one of us owns responsibility for being fluent in power, for understanding how power operates, the ways in which power and powerlessness can compound, the way in which power is always fluid and never static, understanding how we aggregate power. We're going to be learning from, yes, some of our speakers on stage here about these things, but you're going to be learning from each other. I cannot emphasize that enough. You're going to be learning from each other because everybody here has a story. Everybody here has an experience, and everybody here has a place from which they come where the allocation of power is fair or unfair, just or unjust, perfect or imperfect. And every one of us has a role in making it better. Which brings me then to the second part of the equation, this idea of character. You know, character is a word that seems a little bit old-fashioned. It seems a little bit scoldy. You know, have good character. And I don't mean character in some purely personal sense like be diligent, be on time, be honest in your dealings. Yes, those things matter on the personal level. But what we're talking about here in the civic context is character in the collective. How we treat one another, how we live in community, how we see ourselves as woven into a fabric of relationship and obligation, how we learn to think and act and speak and dream and behave as if we were not on little islands unto ourselves, as if we were not sociopaths. Character in the collective is not a left or right idea. I really want to emphasize that. We're going to be hearing from speakers today who cross the political spectrum and whose politics you can't put easily into one box or another. That's part of character as well, is remaining open in heart and mind to ideas and points of view that we can't easily put in a box or easily put in a category, whether that is a category of ideology or race or position or status. But last night, we heard about different aspects of this notion of character in the collective when we spoke and dove deep into the notions of dignity, of the simple need, the human need for recognition. I see you, I see you as fully human. When Jasmine last night was speaking about simply seeing and being seen, that takes practice, as she said. That takes work. That is a lot harder, frankly, than even getting the county or city council to change its policies on whether to build this new youth jail. That's hard, and that's going to take more work. But really learning to see one another, that's harder. Character in the collective is about that recognition of the need and the centrality of recognition. It is about justice. It is about recognizing mutuality that we are woven again in this interdependent network, that we are nodes on that network, each one of us influencing and shaping one another, setting off contagions of action or passivity, of compassion or not compassion, of civility or incivility, of courtesy or discourtesy, recognizing the ways in which we make that happen that society becomes how we behave. Another aspect, of course, of this notion of character in the collective is about redemption. Yesterday, in a pre-conference session, I heard from a woman named Fania Davis who runs an organization in Oakland called Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. And Fania in some of her work, not only working with young people who have been discarded, 
disengaged, disconnected, disrespected, made invisible by society. And working with them, finding that a system that merely responds to whatever harms they might do with more harm, that punishes in a retributive way, is a society that only creates a perpetual cycle of harm and retribution. That there is a place in this society for restoration alongside retribution, and indeed to surpass retribution. And that is true not only in the context of our criminal justice system, that is true in how we see and hear and forgive one another our trespasses. Forgive one another when we argue about politics. Forgive one another when we encounter views foreign to our own. Forgive one another when someone in the moment does not see us or sees us too quickly or assumes something about us when they see us. That we have that capacity to forgive, but that we believe in other people's capacity to redeem themselves, because that too is contagious. And that notion of character in the collective is what our broken, fissured, fragmented body politic today needs deeply. This is not about bipartisanship or even cross-partisanship. This is at the spirit level first, about a willingness to embrace and recognize that for all our differences, we are in this web of mutuality and reciprocity. Power plus character. Power plus character. I just want you to hold that equation in your mind all the rest of today and all the rest of your days. Because our responsibility in coming together here today is to feed ourselves, to learn from one another, to find provocation and inspiration. As Buki said last night uh, in our panel on Ferguson and Beyond, that distinction, that fine distinction that she drew between interactions and conversations as citizens that are on the one hand unsafe and on the other hand uncomfortable, I thought was a beautiful distinction. Our job and our responsibility here is to create a space that is safe for all of us to be, to be different, to disagree, to engage one another with respect and courtesy and compassion and a belief in the possibility of learning and healing. But our job also is to embrace discomfort, to embrace the opportunities to be challenged in our presumptions and our premises about what is and what ought to be. And if we do that today, then we will recognize that the whole reason why we've decided to get together for a couple of days and be in this room together and then be held by one another is not only so that we can have an awesome start to spring 2015, but it's so that we can go forth so that everybody in this room, when you go back to Austin, or Oakland, or Detroit, or Philadelphia, when you go back to Idaho, when you go back to Spokane, when you go back to Renton, when you go back to Orange County, when you go back to northern New Mexico, when you go back to Alabama, when you go back to Florida, when you go back to every part of this country to carry forth some of this spirit, and to carry forth some of the practices that you'll have learned and to carry forth this notion that power plus character equals citizenship and that our jobs perpetually are to become more literate in power, become more steeped and grounded in this notion of character and become the kind of citizens that the United States promised at the outset we could all be. Citizens capable of governing a republic. We haven't gotten there yet, but we can. We can and we will.